you are listening to the Scaling Culture Podcast, where we sit down with thought leaders who share their experiences building incredible workplace cultures. Bill Flynn is the author of the best-selling book, Further Faster, the vital few steps that take the guesswork out of growth. He's collaborated with Alan Mulally, pitched Steve Jobs, has worked for and advised hundreds of companies, including startups, where he has a long track record of success spanning multiple industries. Today, Bill talks about some key things to building strong organizational culture, how to lead a team, how to build a psychologically safe environment, and how to be curious and always find the root cause. Welcome to another episode of the Scaling Culture Podcast. I'm uh, extremely uh, excited to have Bill Flynn uh, on as our guest today. Bill, welcome. You're coming in from Boston. I am. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate you having me on. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know uh, you and I have been back online, or sorry, back and forth online. We seem to be quite aligned with, you know, our thoughts on culture, uh, et cetera. So, so it was great. It just seemed like a natural fit to get you on here. Great. I'm glad to be here. And you're in my favorite U.S. city. We just said this. Boston is like, I love, I love Boston. I love the underbelly. I, I kind of love that there's some Irish and mafia stuff going on there. I love it, actually. <laughs> Yeah, well, I fit right in. I'm I'm a, a 100% Irish, so you know. Oh my, wow! My uh, grandfather was born in Ireland and came on over here, and so I'm, I guess I'm second generation. Love it. I, I'm kind of third. My my great grandfather. So I'm, my family's the Connollys. My mom's maiden name was oh, Connolly, okay. and my great grandfather was exiled from Kil- Killarney. Uh, Ireland. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, mine are all from Cork. I, oh, I, yeah. I grew up with the poor people, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? And most most of the Cork people are in Australia, I think, because they were exiled a long time ago by the British. Right, right. Well, look, um, I'm sure maybe this is why we're so connected is these Irish roots. Maybe Irish people also, you know, they run strong cultures there. Uh, that's Very probably true. the case. I'm sure that's it. Let's go with that. So, yeah, that's right. So, Bill, tell you, you uh, tell us a little about your, your book and, and why you decided to write it. Yeah, so um, I, I decided to write it because people told me to write it more, more than anything. Uh, I'm, I do write, but I write mostly to learn. Um, I don't actually like to write. Uh, it's, I find it very difficult. Um, but, uh, you know, I've been coaching for three or four, year, four years or so. I've been speaking for a number of years. And uh, although a, a lot of the stuff that we do and, and a lot of stuff that you do, and, you know, it comes from the past we've got you know we've got Deming and Shine and Drucker and you know and all these people that we've built on and you know we've got Vern and you know we've got Buckingham and you know mm. name your cynic yeah. you're all sort of doing the the same thing over and over again because it works um, but I was told often that sort of the way I look at things is a little bit different it might be just sort of my my startup background I've done a ton of startups you know that sort of painted me a certain way, but I've also been really curious about business over a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm a neuroscience geek. So I, I sort of, I look at things from a first principles perspective. Okay. I'm always trying to break it down into, you know, what's the root cause of this thing. And so what you mean when you say first principles is, is you, is what's the root cause? Yeah. You keep going, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the way I like to think about it is leaders often solve the problem that's in front of them. Yeah. And, and I try to teach them to try to solve the problem that's creating the problem that's in front of them. Mm -hmm. And if you keep moving back, and doing that, you'll eventually find out the root cause or pretty close to it. And, and that's the first principle. Um, so, um, so I, I decided, you know, what the heck, I'll give it a, sh- I'll give it a go. Uh, and I hired a company since I don't like to write. I decided I wouldn't do that to myself. It would probably take me a decade to write. Uh, so I worked with Scribe Media, uh, who I really, I really love. Uh, love Scribe. With. Our second yeah. book's coming out with Scribe. Actually, same. Excellent. We hired them. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so, so that was it. And, and the main reason why is that, uh, since I've been studying business for about 30 years, I found, you know, most businesses fail. Uh, you got a 50% chance of lasting five years, a 25% chance of lasting 15 and about a 16% chance of lasting 25. So the longer you're in business, the more likely it is you're going to go out of business, which just seems a little counterintuitive to me. You think the more you do it, the more you get better at it. Right. I mean, right. I mean your, your story, you got, you improved, right. you you found that, you did things differently and, and you didn't, you did things wrong or, or it didn't work out well and you learned and you got better. And, but that doesn't seem to be the standard. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's a shame that a lot of really good businesses, good ideas and really great people fail or struggle for completely preventable reasons. So that's what my book is about. It's, it's kind of the 80, 20 principle applied to, you know, what you and I know with scaling up or any of these sort of business operating systems. But I found that there are three things that 
that really are the things that if you do them really well, uh, you have a much better chance of having a successful business. And that's, and that's sort of the whole premise of further faster. And, and what are those three? Let's walk us through that. Uh, performance is a team sport. I love it. Um, 80% of people are on a, at least one team. Mm-hmm. Yet we don't teach people how to be team leaders. We just right. sort of expect them. It's sort of like parenthood, right? Oh, you have kids. It's like, oh, you know, you'll be a parent. You'll figure it out. But t- leading a team is a skill. Yes. Uh, and it can be taught. Uh, but we don't teach it. Uh, we just sort of let sink or swim. The next is um, that you need to have a system. If you're going to build a, a business that's repeatable and scalable, it has to be systematized. There has to be pro- systems and processes that do it. And the main two systems that go together, really two sides of the same coin, are strategy and execution. Mm. You know, you execute your strategy. Uh, and your strategy has to be something that allows you to differentiate yourself from others, to become the choice of the main set of people you want to work with. Uh, and then lastly, if you want to grow your business, cash has to be a primary financial metric. Cash is an antecedent to growth. Uh, and we have to spend in order to grow our business. And we have to spend in front of growing our business. Yet we don't really think a lot about cash. We think about profit, revenue, et cetera. And revenue is great. You know, it's great to brag to your brother-in-law or tell a reporter or whatever. But you need, if you're going to grow in the next two, three, four years, the first thing you should do is figure out how much is that going to cost us? How many people do we need to hire? Do we have to bring a factory in? What do we have to do with the training skills software? Great. Now let's build a plan that generates that amount of cash for us so we don't have to go outside the business to get it. So those Love are three that. things, team, a system, and cash. The, uh, you know, it's, I was just making a note as you're talking, I think you're spot on with all that stuff, you know, and I think from my experience of the, how each of those things of what you talked about played a significant role. Uh, and if we hadn't, you know, in times that we took our eye off those balls, we, we floundered, we really did. And when we leaned in and doubled down, we, we did better. So it's great. Um, Bill, tell me, when did, what was your aha moment? When did, you know, cause you didn't really, you, you talked about um, providing leadership skills and, and how to run teams, but what about culture? because it's a huge part of it. We know that. When did, when did you have your aha moment? You know, I was talking about mine being reading uh, the book nuts where I'm like, wow, is this really true? Like, does this actually work? Wow. It does. I ran into an employee. They confirmed the story. I ripped up the book and went to work. What was your moment where you're like, okay, there's strategy, but man, culture is important here. Yeah. So, I mean, you got the whole standard thing, right? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. And all that right. Kind of stuff. You know, so I always found that interesting intellectually, but I didn't, it didn't, infuse in me right uh yeah when until, did it infuse went yeah go ahead yeah so about 10 years ago i had a situation where i took over a business uh, so i was brought into to a startup and the guy basically said make me look bigger so i can get sold i want to be sold for as much as i possibly can and i'm a sales marketing guy i'm coming in i'm, I'm an operator I'm, I'm gonna make the thing uh bigger uh, which we did and then he left and i took over uh, the business. And the day I took over the business, it was an email hosting company before Gmail and, and Office 365 were really something. This was about 2008, 2009. Um, the entire thing collapsed on itself. And I had, I had 60 people working for me. It was a, almost a $10 million business at the time. Uh, so I had to do something. Uh, and I, I had been studying business for a while. It's some really good CEOs. And I, and I said, what do I need to do? And, and I, I need to be able to create an environment where I and the team can make this thing work. So very similar to your, you know, you, I, I guess we consider your famous story with the guy with the, with the car. Ashwani. Uh, Ashwani, that's it. I always forget his name, Ashwani. He's famous. Uh, I made this guy famous. He made, he me, did. He did. <laughs> he made me rich. I made him famous. <laughs> um, so, you know, I said, I said, guys, here's the deal. I, I don't know how to do a lot of the stuff in the business. I don't know how to run a network infrastructure. I've never run tech support before. Finance, I've got no finance background whatsoever. So I said, we have to create this environment. But my job is to tell you where, where I think is a good ending. You know, what's a good vision? Where, what, what does it look like when we get there? And your job is to, to debate me and, and, and challenge me and, and, and make sure that we're, we're all aligned on that. But once we do that, then I need you to go ahead and make it happen in your, your part of the world. And we're going to work together. So that was sort of, um, I, I started that as a premise, you know, sort of intellectually. And, and it worked fabulously. Um, we turned the business around. Uh, we lost a thousand customers in like a week. And then I had to spend months trying to, wow. trying to, trying to keep it going. We had seven or 8,000 customers at the time, but I didn't lose one employee. Um, they were 
much happier and engaged. And we did some fun things around culture, you know, and, and rewarding and, and focusing on that one critical thing that we need to get done to make sure that we were successful. Um, uh, we, uh, I left to do another startup after, but basically the business doubled in about two years. Um, we, so, so we increased- Let me just play that piece back yeah. to you. So it was getting these people finally engaged, getting them aligned really was, was instrumental, pivotal in turning the business around. Exactly. And I look so, back and I'm like, wow, this this stuff really works, right? It works, right. Because um, until you see the actual return, the outcome, it's it's fairy tales, right? Exactly. And and how I knew it worked is we I did this one thing that um, we called it uh, the Spark system, right? And it's in my book. Uh, and what you could do is you could so the, the company was called Group Spark. So we took the Spark, we verb reverbified it. And you could anyone could spark anyone else, and it was around service. We were, we were an email hosting company, but basically we were a service company. Uh, and so, if you saw someone who was doing a great job helping out a customer, going above and beyond, or someone who was helping someone go above and beyond, then you could spark them. You know, you don't need permission. You would write out an email uh, telling what they did. Uh, we give them fifty bucks immediately. At the end of the month, we gather them all together. Who got the fifty? Who wrote it, or who who was nominated? Uh, the person who nominated the person would write it up. Uh, who did? Who did the? You know the the over. So the I nominate you. I get fifty. You get fifty. I uh, no no. I'm sorry. The person who got fifty was the person who was nominated. nominated. Gotcha. Okay. I was gonna say that person yeah. got ripped off. I just started yeah, nominating I was say, people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what was when I sort of knew culture was there was we, we did this blue ribbon thing and you know these are we're all 30, 40, 50 years old, you know it's kind of hokey. But right. when I walked around, it was all cubes. When I walked around the office, when you, so if, you've probably been in a cube environment. You, you, you know, you can't really see the person, maybe see the top of their head until you get to that point in the cube where you can see in. And guess where all the ribbons were? They were on the wall opposite that. They wanted you to see their ribbon as soon as you walked in their cube. They I weren't hiding it. Too. It was prominent. And I said, you know what? This thing's kind of working. Yeah, we're onto something. Yeah. And so you talk about psychological safety, and I'm assuming that when you're seeing this, when you're in it, you maybe didn't know the importance of that, and this became later on. Tell me more about psychological safety, when that hit you, and then, and then how do you implement that? How do you achieve that? Yeah, well, psychological safety is from Amy Emmetson. Uh, she's a Harvard Business uh, School professor and a researcher. She's coined the term, I don't know how many years ago. Um, and, you know, she's... I love the way she sort of talks about it. She says, you know, it turns out that no one wakes up in the morning, jumps out of bed and says, I can't wait to go to work today to look ignorant, incompetent, intrusive, or negative, right? We, we, we want to be the opposite of that. But we create this environment, mostly inadvertently, where if you don't want to look incompetent, don't, don't, don't um, say that you're weak, right? If you don't want to look ignorant, don't ask any questions. If you want to look intrusive, don't offer ideas. And if you want to look negative, don't challenge the status quo. And that's how the environment that we create. Psychological safety is, is the opposite of that. It's creating an environment where you can, you can say, I don't know something, I made a mistake, um, uh, I'm sorry. And you're not gonna get retribution or ridicule or scorn for doing that. Uh, and when you do that, you basically give people's brains back to them and allow them to start helping you get to where you wanna go as opposed to you pulling them along. You just naturally used our, our uh what do you call it? The subtitle of Outrageous Empowerment, giving people their brains back. You just use it. I probably stole it from you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> when it's something good, I take it. <laughs> I love it. So, so great. We've got theory, makes sense. How do we do it? So um, this is the story I always tell, which I think really exemplifies it. Uh, and, and this is where we do it. And we don't even know we're doing it. So let's say we're in a, we're in a, uh, we're in a meeting and you're my boss and I'm running the meeting and the meeting's over and you, everyone starts to leave you just tap me on the shoulder and you say hey bill uh, i got a few things i want to tell you about this meeting can you come back to my office what i want to talk about so what goes through my head immediately in trouble I'm, like, I'm in trouble what did i do wrong uh and now i'm following you back to your office which is a status symbol as you sit behind your disc desk which is another status symbol and by the time I'm, I'm sitting there i have already gone through and catastrophized right i have said Oh my God, am I going to get fired? If I get fired, you know, I'm not going to be able to send the kids to college. We're not going to be able to take that great vacation, et cetera. So by the time I'm sitting across from you, my brain is in full threat mode. And I'm not really paying attention to what you're saying because I can't. It's impossible. I'm probably you're in your own head. Yeah. I'm in my own head. And you, you might lost your job. You're losing your home. You're going to lose your partner. Your kids are going to be homeless. Like it's not good. 
Right. And you might be just saying, hey, you know, I just want to know, hey, that was a really good meeting. You know, I had a couple ideas, whatever, you know, any of it's nothing, but who cares at that point? So what you could have done differently in this hypoth hypothetical situation is you could have sat down next to me and said, hey, Bill, that was a pretty good meeting. But as you know, Kaizen is one of our principles, our values. You know, we want to continuously improve. So what I'd like to do is put, a put on my calendar a coffee or a lunch and uh, I want you to come to that meeting with three things that you thought went really, really well in this meeting and that we should keep doing or get, get better at. I want you to come with one or two things that you thought didn't go as, quite as well as you thought, and, and we can work with ways to improve it. So, it's a, it, you, so, so Bill, you're having a pre-meeting to the actual meeting and exactly. giving some context. So the person really knows what's going to happen. I'm going to, I've got some time. I've been asked for some help here. I'm going to research a few things as well as debrief in my mind what happened, right? Exactly. Yeah. So there's this, uh, so I'm a big neuro geek, as I said, and I, and I do a lot of things at Neuro Leadership Institute. And, and David Rock has come up with something called, uh, the guy who runs it is called SCARF, which stands for Status, Certainty, Autonomy, Relatedness, and Fairness. And, and his theory is that your brain is assessing these things several times a second. Are you a friend or a foe? Am I safe or not? Etc. And the first thing you did, you inadvertently triggered a number of those things, right? You clearly triggered status, you, certainty. I had no idea what we we're gonna do. I was completely out of control. I was following you back to your office and you were gonna tell me what. Uh, at this point, I don't know if it's fair, but boy, it didn't seem that fair right now. So, so we do that a lot. So, so that's when you have to sort of really mesh the two things together and say, in order to create psychological safety, you have to realize that the brain, you have to at least understand a little bit about the brain. How it works. The, right, and, and it's, it's it's always moving towards reward and away from threat. Mm. So your job as a leader is to create a situation where you're moving the brain towards reward as often as you can. So that's, and if you can do that in this it's situation- It's really funny, Bill. I'm just, as you're, I think this is gold and I'm just thinking back. I was just calling someone from my office before our chat. And I know this person can get a little anxious. Like if they, th it's exactly who you described. And I was like, in my head, I was like, if I just say, call me back, I want to go, you know, talk about something. I know that they're not going to be able to have lunch today. I just know <laughs> that even though they know me. And so of course, in my message, you know, a similar version of this, I said, I've got some ideas I wanted to run by you. And I think just hearing that would bring them down a little bit and be like, oh, this is a safe conversation. Ron's just going to, you know, he's got some what if ideas here. Uh, it, it seems like it's in a similar context to that, right? It's a pre-priming of that. And I love that. So I want to go through that again. Scarf, walk us through again and, and, and kind of talk through this point or, or the, you know, go back to this, um, uh, this visual and, and, and go back to the, uh, the different letters. Sure. So, um, so again, again. The, the, the premise is that you're, so uh, there's a great, there's a great quote. I love Bill Bryson. I don't know if you know who Bill Bryson is. He's a great no. writer. He's walk in the woods and, and some other things. He's, he's sort of this uh, satirical guy. And he's written this book called, I think, The Body. And he talks about the brain. He said, the great paradox of the brain is that everything you know about the world is provided to you by an organ that itself has never seen the world. It exists in silence and darkness, like a dungeoned prisoner. It has no pain receptors, literally no feelings. It's never felt warm sunshine or a soft breeze. To your brain, the world is just a stream of electrical pulses like taps of Morse code. Very and out of the bare and neutral information creates for you, quite literally creates a vibrant three-dimensional centrally engaging universe. Your brain is you. Everything else is just plumbing and scaffolding. Um, so you need to understand that that's the way it is. And, and, and so when you, when you understand that that's what the brain is doing, the brain is basically designed to keep you alive. And more so it's, it's to keep you not dead. So it's always, it's always going biasing towards negativity. And you as a leader have to understand that. Um, so the SCARF is a great methodology that I, I use. I use it with like Pat Lencioni's five dysfunctions and that kind of yeah. stuff. They sort of mix well together. So I teach that, you know, there are five things. There's, there's science out there or research out there that says uh, your brain is doing this five times every second. It's assessing the environment. Um, and these five things are SCARF, uh, which is status, meaning uh, are you above me or below me? Uh, you got certainty, which is, you know, do I know what's going to happen? Do I have understanding of what, what's going to happen? But but I want to stop at certainty for a sec because I want to yes. go back to that exact example I just gave of giving someone a phone call. I've had lots of conversations with that person, but I still 
know how their brain works. And, and, and even though they know the play, they will, um, it's a word I'm looking for that they'll, they'll always anchor to uncertainty, right? Okay. Keep going. Yeah, they will. And so, so that's the other thing you make a really good point, which is you can't treat everyone the same. You have to treat everybody unfairly because we all are coming at this in different ways. And, And I think COVID, you know, we're in the middle of COVID right now. Everyone is experiencing COVID differently. And depending on how they're experiencing it is how they're going to bring themselves to a conversation or to a relationship. Uh, so, you know, if, if you're really, really afraid of COVID, um, you're going to be a different person until you feel like it's a safe thing again. I, I have a, it's funny, I have a family down the street that, that, that we, we hang out with and, and the dad is completely scared. He, he has walled himself off from the rest of his family because he's wow. got teenage kids and he just is deathly afraid his well, wife Bill, is, Bill, does he just not want to deal with them let's be honest well, you know, let's call him yeah. let's call that is him an out point. <laughs> i'm gonna do the same thing i got a two and a four year old and i'm just terrified that i'm gonna sneeze on them uh yeah true well he's got teenagers he's afraid they're gonna <laughs> even <sneeze>. worse <laughs> anyway so and his wife is dealing with it differently and then he's got the kids who, who really it's like a mask is whatever it's a little inconvenient but they're not really that afraid about it. even if i get it who cares i mean that's i think a really good metaphor of of, of who's in your business right you have to understand yeah. who they are and treat them differently mm, it is a great so, metaphor that's great so autonomy is control do i have any control over this situation and again back to covid that's one thing that we can do as leaders is we can give people co- some control over something Give them some meaningful work, something that's cohesive, that ties to the greater good, but also something they can do and they can, they can manage. Uh, that's a wonderful thing that you can give to your team to help them feel a little bit better about what's going on around us. Uh, the second thing, uh, the, uh, the fourth thing is R, which is relatedness. Am I the in or the out group? So right. walk me through that. You want to have a conversation with me. You know, you, we're going to go to your office. And how does, what is my brain saying to myself the, the, in, in that piece? Of the Around relatedness? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, so this is, we, we did this, we had this in high school, right? You know, where, where the clicks and people talked about you and, and you know, they sort of, you know, you were, you were either a jock or a druggie or a whatever, right? And, and were you in any, you know, were you in the inner, the out group? And that puts us into some sort of a threat mode. So, like I said in my earlier example, sitting down next to you sort of literally put us on the same level. Okay. Um, and also said, hey, you know, we're in this together. There's no in and out group. There's not me, your boss, who wants you to fix this thing and mm-hmm. get it done. It's I'm doing this with you, right? We're, yeah. we're a team. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's that's the kind of thing that you want to make sure that you're understanding is, 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 is um, avoid trying to give the perception even that they're, they're, they're outside the circle. Right, which is done through, hey, come down over here, sit on the other side of this desk. It's me versus you. There's some separation here. So, you know, almost like if you're sitting down in a comfy chair to have a discussion with someone, there's no border of the, the, the boardroom table. You know, even that alone helps with, you know, bringing that person closer, feeling a little safe. Does that make sense? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, and then lastly is fairness. And I, and I always joke, I think we, we as human beings have a fairness gene. Right. You know, we, we will actually um, do things to harm ourselves because we think someone else is unfair. Uh, and there's a there's a, a game called um, the ultimatum game that's been done for decades in science uh, where there are two people who sit across from each other. You give one of them 10 bucks and they have the right to give any amount of money to the other person. But the other person has the right to re- refuse the money. And if they refuse the money, neither party gets any money. And this has been done again, for 30, 40, 50 years. And the same results always come out is if, if the person getting the money doesn't think that the amount is fair, they will reject it, which is completely irrational because they went into the room without any money. They didn't have that money. It's, it's a gift. <laughs> right. But we will reject it if we think something is unfair. And so that's the last thing. We, we want to make sure that something feels right, feels like it's the right thing. Okay. Uh, I love that. And so go to, um, you talk about leading with your brain and your mind, correct? Your brain and mind, yes. Yeah, tell Even me more about that. As, so as each team leader, each founder, each leader in the organization, how do we do unpack that and, and let's get to the how again? Yeah, so again, you, sh- you need to understand that we're all crazy. Human beings have, we're just crazy. I'm not crazy. I am not, I'm the one person. I'm the one guy who's not crazy. <laughs> all right, well, good. Well, then you can set me straight. That'd be awesome. <laughs> well, uh, I'm good and crazy. This is good. We are. We're irrational, impulsive. We're highly emotional. Um, when, when 
I learned about 15 years ago when I was doing sales um, and I wasn't a very good salesperson. I, I was saying, why am, why am I not a good salesperson? I'm, I'm pretty smart. I know my product really well. I'm, I'm a relatively good, a nice guy. People like Likeable, me. yeah. But I wasn't really good at it. And, and so I boiled it down to, well, what is, what is sales really? It's, it's helping someone else make a decision. And so I studied, this is how I got into neuroscience was, how, do the, how does the brain make a decision? And it's not the way I thought. I thought, you know, it's rational, right? Um, you take the economic view, right? It's rational humans Plus and they'll look at the four. data, they'll weigh it. And that is not true at all. When we make a decision, our, our emotional centers of our brain light up first. So we actually make the decision on emotion and then we make up the reasons after. So in essence, to be quite honest, we're lying to ourselves right. most of the time. As, as to why we're doing something. So as a leader, you have to understand that. You have to understand that you're really working with emotional people first. And that's why this whole sense of psychological safety is so important, right? Making sure that you instill a growth mindset, that people, that you know that they're not all, ever at their full potential. There is always something they can learn they can get better at. You know, there's there's limitations and you know, cognitive load and all that kind of stuff, but 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 the 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 wonder of the human brain is that it's plastic and it, and it can change and it can learn new things. It might take some people longer than others, but most stuff you can learn. If you put in the time and effort and have the passion and the love for it, you can, you can get pretty good at some of these things. Dan Coyle's done this around, around, you know, sports and such. He's written a number of books, one called the culture code, which I you love that. I, I, I didn't recognize the name at first, but that was one of my favorite culture books. I really love the stories. Yeah. So, so in order to leave with the brain and mind, you have to understand that we're all a little crazy and, and you have to, you have to understand that you're the, you're the, the symbol that they're looking at to set the standard for this. So what I say is you need to get, be comfortable with, I'm sorry, I don't know, and I need help. Right. That will give permission to everyone else to be human beings. If you always come off as the answer man and you never admit that you don't know something, then you're putting them in this threat mode and you're actually putting them in the out group, right? Cause they're just sort of, you know, what is it? You're enabling them. Um, yeah, and, then, and, and then the other side is there, you are also stealing their growth from them, right? Because I'm giving you the answers. I'm not giving you the opportunity to grow. I've taken it from you. Exactly. So, so when you do that, and we've seen this over and over again, my favorite leader in the whole world uh, and probably for the last century is this guy named Al Mulally, who most people don't know who he is. Uh, and for me, he's the best leader uh, and I've studied tons and tons of leaders. And the reason I think he's the best leader is that, so he was a CEO at Boeing commercial aircraft. And then he was a CEO at Ford. He was, a, he was the uh, CEO at Boeing through 9-11. And he had Boeing come out of 9-11 better than they went in. And then Bill Ford said, I'm in trouble. Can you help me? And he did the same exact thing at Ford through 2008. Beautiful. Uh, when he came into Ford, he came in, I think, in September, October of uh, 2006. They lost $17 billion that year. They were running out of money. When he left in 2014, the year after he left, Ford became again, for the first time since Henry Ford started it, the, the highest selling car company in the world. They had surpassed Toyota. And and what were some of the keys to that success? How did he do yeah, it? Yeah, and so... so since so I love Alan Lally. I've written about him. There's a great book called American Icon that tells the whole Ford story. And it's 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 a fantastic book. It reads like fiction, um, but it gives you great stuff. And and from that, I, I wrote an article a number of years ago about it. Uh, and uh, Alan Mulally read the article. So I'm actually friends with Alan Mulally now. Cool. Uh, which is really kind of cool. Um, and so I've gotten to talk to him and he's just a wonderful, humble human being. And I said, you know, I asked him sort of, how did you do this? He says, you know what, Bill, you got to love them up. That's what you got to do. However, you also have to make sure that they understand the standard and hold them to the standard. Right. The combination of, of you know, they, it's like this with, you know, they say this in families, you can discipline your children. You can even be tough on them sometimes, but you need to, you need to double down in the way you love them. And if you do that, you'll have a good result. You know, you're saying the same thing essentially, right? Standards exactly. and love them up. So really uh, treat them well. And he said, that's it. And in a nutshell, that's what I did. That's, we need a bunch of other stuff, but yeah. yeah. But in terms of, he had to create that environment. Yeah. So, because, you know, it, it's a huge company with, with you know, they had Pontiac and, uh, not Pontiac, they had um, 
Jaguar and and Volvo and a bunch of other brands. They had the Taurus, right. they had all these things. And and uh, it was a very macho culture when he went into it. It was, you, you don't admit, ever admit when you do something wrong. Um, and he used to have a meeting uh, every week with his entire team, like six o'clock in the morning and the people, tons of people on the phone. And it was a quick, it was a red, green, yellow meeting. And they just went through the standard, the standard four or five things. And he said, the first four or five meetings, everything was green. And he finally said, guys, when I came on, Bill told me we're going to lose $17 billion here. You think everything is still green? Mm. And that one guy finally did it. And he said the air came out of the room when the guy spoke. And, uh, and then he said, I started clapping and he, and everyone thought that that was the signal to have the two big, you know, bouncer guys come in and grab Mark Fields out of his chair and rip out of the room. <laughs> right. And, um, but and Bill, what, what did Mark say? He said, we have a problem. He what had shut he down production of his line. Yeah. That's a problem. They're not making any cars. A car maker right. who doesn't make any cars is probably not in green. Right. Right. But he had, he had to let them come to it. Right. He, he was patient. He didn't say, no, I know you're not red, you know, make it red. He just waited and he waited for someone to do it. And finally someone did it. And then eventually everyone started doing red and they started helping each other. Cause Mark spoke up, Mark Fields, who actually took over from Alan Mulally when he left. Um, and he, he told his problem. And then someone said, oh, I, we had that problem in Europe. Let me help you. We, oh, we've had that manufacturing thing over here or whatever. And, and he said, once I started to see that, I knew we were okay. Cause he knew that he had created that culture. He created that safety that people could, say, yeah, we're not perfect, but we can help each other get out of this. I love it. And so I guess the last um, piece, which this kind of lets us flow into is, is, you know, giving, unlocking people's potential. That's what he's doing. And so does it, does it work like that? Once you create this safety, if you lead properly, you know, with, with, with your brain and your mind, you know, does that automatically unlock potential or what else do we need to do? Yeah, I don't think it automatically does. I think it gives the ability for people to then figure out how can I be my best self at work and how can I get the best results at work? So um, I, I'm a big fan of Marcus Buckingham and, and, and Ashley, who you had on, Ashley yeah, Goodall. Goodall. Huge fan of their stuff. Um, so I'm going to steal a little stuff from them. But basically, you know, we as human beings are not well-rounded. We just aren't. Uh, and we have to understand that as leaders is that people skew towards certain things. Um, and your job as a, as a team leader is to figure out the brilliance of someone else and then notice it when they do it and then dig into that and figure out, you know, how did you do that? Let's, let's figure out how you can do that. What, what are those things that you love doing that when you're in flow, right? As Mikhail Lige, whatever his name is, Chikno Mikhail, no, you say his name, um, says, you know, when, when time just, just it disappears. Right. You want to get your team members to be doing that as often as possible, as long as it connects to the larger function and purpose of the team or, and, or the organization. If you right. can combine those two things, that's when the magic happens. Yeah. So you got to do the safety environment first, which then mm -hmm. gives people the, the, you know, the, the comfort to be able to say, you know what, I don't really like doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of like doing this. Uh, and if someone really loves doing something, they will eventually get very good at it. They may not be good at it at the time, but they'll be very good at it. And they're going to put right. time and effort. They're probably going to do it much better than you. Um, so, so when you find that and you get those magic combination of things, that's when the team becomes well-rounded and it starts to just, as I like to say, the magic starts to happen. Yeah. And so that becomes, you know, I think the key starting point there, if I'm hearing you correctly, and, and from Marcus's and Ashley's theory is, you know, Bill, I saw you do something great. Stop. Tell me more. How did you do that? You're really digging into that one thing, this exciting moment. We need to get to the how, right? Exactly. And then and so hoping that how connects to the, to the business that we can do. You can do more of that. This isn't just one one off thing. If you do more of that, it's going to, the result to the business is going to be X, right? Exactly. So yeah. for me, my example is uh, I'm, I'm a very curious person. I'm a horrible student, but I'm an excellent learner. If you, Love that. Right? I would agree. I'm going to, I think I, that would sums me up. <laughs> <laughs> I was terrible. I mean, uh, if you look at my IQ, uh, I should have been a straight A student through high school and college. I was not because it, I didn't get it. Um, I, but the stuff that the things that I loved, whatever class it was that I loved, I got an A in it. It was just like a, a given. Um, so uh, what I found is that I have two really 
big things that, that have helped me to be successful, especially in the startups, is I'm highly curious. I, I love to dig into, I love to ask a lot of questions and really understand, again, root cause and something called, an, I, I love etiology, which is the study of root cause. Um, and the second thing is my brain seems to be pretty good at, at um, pattern matching. I can, I can see a bunch of different things and find the essence usually more quickly than others, which at a startup is pretty good because you're always trying to figure out what, what is this Easy. thing, is it working, is it not working? And, my, and I think my hit rate was pretty good. I was five for six, the first, my first six startups, the first five with either an IPO or an acquisition at, wow. a, at, at least two X, somewhere 10, 12, 20 X. Wow. Um, and I think I had a lot to do that because I was in sales and marketing. So that was my job. Um, so I'm always trying to find things that have me do that as often as possible. Cause that's when my day just flies and it's, it's fun and I have energy. And if you can do that for your people, then you don't have to work as much to be honest with you. It makes your life easy, a lot easier as a leader. And, and so I'm curious, Bill, cause you've, you've had a successful business career. And then today you spend a lot of your time coaching. Is that default design? Is that because look, I don't have to get into the weeds. I can sit outside. And I love this. Tell me more about why you've you know, making, made the, the, the uh, transition to coach. Yeah. So uh, two reasons. One is that startups are hard. Uh, Very. You take a lot of time and energy. And I did it for 25 years. It's, it's a long time. Um, I would definitely do another one. I, I actually had a hard time really trying to figure out how to find what I call a Goldilocks founder. Uh, a Goldilocks founder to me is someone who's crazy, but not too crazy. You got to wow. sort of be in that wonderful little zone in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I, I just had a hard time finding that. And my last four, my last four startups were not great. Uh, it was not a great experience for me. We didn't do very well. Most of them didn't survive. Um, and I had this opportunity. Actually, Vern was the person who, who got me into it. I was saying, hey, you know, I built this system that I talked about earlier with the Spark thing. I built this sort of system on my own. I wasn't smart enough to know that there was a, a scaling up or an EOS or whatever out there. I, I made my own um, and it worked great. Um, but it was the feeling that I got from helping those people, those, right. those leaders that I was with, who, um, when, I, when I left my last day or last week, two of them came up to me, two of the least experienced managers that I had worked with. And they said pretty much the same thing to me, which was, hey, Bill, I want you to know the thing that you made us do, we hated it. It was really, really hard. But we're so glad you made us do it because now I know how to do it, right? I've, I taught them to fish, basically. And I wanted to do more of that. And that's what basically coaching is. I can now do it on a grander scale. That's why I wrote a book, right? I said, look, just follow these things. Alan Mulally, you know, Alan Mulally is in my book uh, because the stuff he did at Ford is exactly the stuff that's in my book. And he did it at Ford years and years, years before. And I didn't know who he was until after I wrote my book, really, um, about what he actually did. And so it, it's, there are few things that truly matter uh, and but those things that do matter tremendously, and I wanted to teach people what those things were in business, so I could get that feeling again, of of having them say, "Man, you know, you helped me. You made a difference right. in my life. You didn't do it for me. You helped me to do it for for myself." Makes perfect sense. I, I love that. Well, well, Bill. Anything else that we didn't talk about today that you think is important uh, to the audience from a messaging, from a culture leadership perspective? Anything we didn't talk about? That's a good question. What are you working on now? Yeah, um, I don't think so. I think we did a good job. Okay. Uh, nothing right. else that I usually talk about we didn't cover, um, or or even we yeah. yeah we covered some new stuff which was great. Okay. You know, it's funny. I'll go back to your comment uh, during the pandemic. I've I think two things. I was I was looking for this aha moment. You know, I'm, I've been an entrepreneur since I was 21 years old, and um, I think two things hit me. One, I, I certainly had leadership fatigue. You know, and as leaders, not just founders, as leaders in organizations, um, you know, you don't get the pat on the back. You you have to keep it all together financially. This that you know, it, I mean, is just a lot of pressure. And so I found that. Uh, and the other thing is, to your point, I don't know if I'll do another startup. I think I would the exact same strategy, find the right person and make a bet, um, which is also, you know, there's there's a 60% chance that doesn't work either. But I don't think I, at 41, have the energy to to do that now. I, I, I think I will acquire companies, partner with people, invest. I don't think I'll start from scratch another business. Yeah. Well, my, so I, 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 everything that I do with my clients, uh, I do for my own company. And my purpose is ser simplified servanthood. 
So I want to help again? people simple simplified s- servanthood. Simplify servanthood. That's great. Uh, and my BHAG is touch a million lives. So I'm at 30, 30 about thirty thousand right now. So I got a long way to go. So what and, am I? 30, 30, yeah, 30, I don't, I don't I count you, but I, you know, I can put you on there if you want. Put me on there, man. I'm making notes. This is beautiful. This is great. Uh, so that's well, what I do. Everything I do is trying to do that. That's why I wrote the book. That's why, you know, the relationship with Alan Mulally, I'm going to be in the MG 100, I think, you know, so I'm going to wow. now start to expand that mm-hmm. out. I, I want to make a, a difference. Again, I, I think we don't need to be doing it the way we're doing it. Right. Um, so that's my purpose. And I'll do that until I can't do it anymore. Love it. Well, well, Bill, look, thanks for your time today. I really enjoyed the conversation. I learned a lot myself. And so thanks. Uh, uh, thanks from me and, and from everybody listening today. Great. Thanks for having me on. If you want to learn more about Bill or anything else related to Scaling Culture, please see the show description for details. If you're enjoying the Scaling Culture podcast, please subscribe. We'll be back next week with another incredible guest.